So every so often something might pop up on your phone that says software update. If we're lucky, that means a couple new emojis or some bug fixes, but the words software update mean a hell of a lot more in Formula E. And we're back at the headquarters of the ERT Formula E team to find out exactly what that means. That's crazy. Like, the amount of processing my brain is doing yeah. just to get round the track and keep the car out of the wall and not spinning every five seconds. Yeah, this is the thing. Like, and then hitting the energy and every, like, yeah, yeah. wow. So what I'm sort of starting to learn is that the simulator really isn't for Dan and Sergio. It's, it's an element of that where they get used to the track, but really it's about providing the team and the engineers with all that data to be able to perfect those strategies and get energy management in a good place. Exactly. Uh, yes, there's an element for the driver, but I'd say maybe that's 20% of the day. And the other 80% is really team information to turn up in a, in a better position than we would do otherwise. So is it safe to say that because this season there's effectively nothing that's going to change with hardware, software is where all the gains can be made and therefore the simulator is even more important? Yeah, exactly. The, the accuracy of the simulator and the better we can make it allows us to basically do our testing without testing. So uh, the, the more accurate we can make that tool, the more useful it is at the circuit. It's talked a lot about how influential the simulator is in all racing, but you know, specifically in Formula E racing. Today's is another example of seeing really how important it is because there is so much that goes into it, not just from a data point of view, but from a driver point of, uh, point of view to prepare you for a race. It's mainly important for the team, like um, in terms of uh, how we can predict energy management, um, especially for a new circuit. When we approach a new circuit, it, it varies from track to track, but some circuits we will get uh, 3D scan information, so LiDAR scans of the surfaces, which we can then use in the simulator. So in those cases, we'll have an idea of the bumps and cambers of the circuit, and that's extremely helpful whenever you turn up to a new venue. As a driver, you can get carried away in the sim because obviously you can go through walls and stuff, but it's very important, on, on, on particularly on race runs and, and sessions where you're gathering what needs to be realistic team uh, data for the team that you drive as you would in real life. Because obviously if you're driving 10% over the limit, that's just not going to work. We, uh, yeah, just try to gather as much information as we can and more than the next team and hopefully turn up in a better position. I like that, more than the next team. Always looking for those little gains. You need to have an edge if you can all the time. So I've had a few laps uh, trying out different settings, seeing how the wheel works, seeing what can be done with the software. And now to really put that into perspective, we've changed some things to basically take software out of the equation. All of that assistance that's come from the control systems has now been taken away. I'm going to see how much that changes on the track. I'm actually very nervous. Last little curve onto the straight. Oh my God, I'm really nervous about this first corner with no assist on. Need a good exit. No software to help me. Here we go, right, onto the straight. Looking for that same braking marker, 100. Lifting, on the brake. Uh, there's a big lock up, uh, I'm not turning. Uh, no, no, yeah, that's it, game over. And that's turn one. <laughs> yeah, it is literally. If that's turn one, is, lap yeah, one. Yeah. That's game over. Yeah. It does make that big of a difference. It feels like the car just wants to shake around rather than slowing down and going through the corner. Like I'm feeling it a lot more in the wheel. It feels, uh, it's really weird to say, but it feels like lighter, but not in a good way. What is it about a Formula E car, both hardware and software, and what you do as a team that enables drivers to be able to race more efficiently? So the main, the main guidance the drivers have in the race is following what we call coast lights or tones that they hear in their headset, and that will guide them as to when, when they need to coast for each of the corners. Um, and that is all affected by the previous corner because if they over discharge coming out of there then that affects their coast speed for the next corner and then they don't charge as much as they need to and then they're most likely going to over consume for that lap. Yeah and then you'll have bleeps and that's when you should lift. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And then so that so then you can do a few laps like that or like a lap. Well I'm like literally not even putting any back anything back on. It'll give you the lights sort of near the near the start finish line. 
Yeah, so I'm lifting there. You lift up, lift there. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then breaking crazy. like you would not yeah or as late as you can obviously and carry the most minimum speed because then yeah. obviously the most minimum speed is the most um, efficient. The drivers can also adjust the coast lights themselves. So if they see if they're um, over consuming by 0.2 or 0.02 even, they can adjust the coast lights that will then help them match their target for that lap. Um, and that, that's another way the system sort of helps the drivers manage their energy themselves. So you've got your live energy target and what your last lap was. So it says, like, E last lap. So you over consumed on the last lap minus 0.5, which is not huge, but this lap minus 3.5, that's enormous. So like, that would make a big difference, like in a race, if you were to over consume that much in one lap. Energy code we got. Seven Delta 37 Foxtrot. I'm probably gonna have to over consume for a bit though, I would say. Okay, let's keep it sensible, stay around the points. So let's dive into that a little bit deeper, the tones and beeps. I've, yeah. I've experienced a little bit in the simulator. Yeah. I can see it on the dash and you can hear it in the, in the headset. What data is being analysed in order to set those targets? Um, so that a lot of that comes from the simulations that we run, um, which we then take the sort of main energy maps, as it were, and put it into the car. And then the system will sort of look at the energy maps and see what the discharge is for each of the, the straights. Okay. Um, and then from that point, it will analyse how much discharge they've used, um, and then it will count or predict how much, at what point they need to coast. Okay. So that's where sort of the, the crux of the sort of energy calculations come from for the whole system to work. Is it more is it more specific than that? That even based on the corner, there might be an, abil an ability to regenerate energy even more in one corner than another. So therefore that will strain, that will change what the driver's hearing and seeing. It, yeah, exactly. Um, so if, as I say, if they over consume or, you know, they over attack a corner, say, and they start scrubbing off speed, that is a waste of energy. So if, by the time they get to the next corner, the coast lights will see that they've over discharged and of course they'll, it all, the coast lights will have to come earlier to counteract for that, which then makes them vulnerable going into the corner. Okay. Um, so what, what we try to do is, well, through the deal and through the simulator, we try and come up with sort of optimum distributions where you can take some energy from a corner that's very difficult to overtake, and you can put that for a corner that is much easier to overtake. Um, you know, we practice that here in the simulator and get the driver's feedback as to what they think you know, is suitable for that track. You know, we're not racing drivers. Um, and then at the track, we then may try it on an LCP lap and then look at the data and go, well, okay, that doesn't really align with what we see. So maybe we have to change it again. And I think that when, when we go to the track, the critical point is getting it to match the simulations. So things like apex speeds are really critical because if you overslow for the apex, you then got to use the same amount of discharge and then get to a slower coast speed which means you then regen or an undercharge for the next corner so it's, it's that sort of thing that once you get to the track it changes a bit um, and you have to sort of think on your feet and up issue simulations and look at the track grip and see if what is expected you know there's a lot of variables that can affect it once you get there. It's the opening round of the 2024 ABB FIA Formula E World Championship. So Mike, we're continuing our journey, our education on the software energy management side of Formula E. We're now on the racetrack where all the action happens and everything comes into play. What's different this time round based on last year? What sort of software changes have been implemented this season? If we look back to last season, so that was the, the first event of the, the Generation 3 car. So if we look at the, the process between that race and this race, there's been a huge amount of changes. So it's it's very different setup to what we had last year. So we, we learned a lot during the year. We learned a lot, a lot during off-season testing. Uh, and we bring that together. And uh, yeah, so the position we're in now is, is quite different to last year. So last season, we saw a very unique style of racing in Formula E. We saw the peloton effect, everyone chasing the slipstream and then kind of waiting until later in the race to really push. What have you taken from that in terms of how you now approach uh, the races this season in terms of the energy management side of things? Yeah, it's quite different. This time last year uh, was a very steep learning curve uh, with the toe effect and all the teams were evolving and it was a rapidly changing process over the first few races. Stay in the slipstream, save energy. 
teams have realised you can save a substantial amount of energy from being in the slipstream and other, that's why no one wants to lead. Um, and so you get that sort of bunching up effect. By the end of the season, uh, it became more clear the trends that were happening, so now we approach races quite differently. We plan in a simulator what we think is going to happen, what the style of race is going to be, but even with that you can't predict what the leader might decide to do. So they might decide something that's not optimum uh, and you have to be ready for that as well. That's the bit that I find so fascinating because you can do all of the prep, all of the work back at the base in the simulator and then you get here and it's kind of like well, only so much of it is in your control. You have to constantly be adapting to what's going on around you. Yeah, you can't predict what the, the human element of it so you can do what's theoretically possible but if the leaders don't do that they dictate the pace of the field uh, and you have to be ready to react to that. It's such a unique aspect of Formula E racing and it, I think it's honestly what makes it so great and competitive. Exactly.